it's Monica here. Welcome to the data podcast for nerds, where we get to talk to some pretty awesome data professionals and ask them how they use data basically to solve the world's problems. Today with us, we have Steve Schaefer, who I used to work with when back in the day when I was an auditor. <laughs> Welcome with us, Steve. How are you doing? Thank you so much. Hey, Monica. I'm doing very well. How are you doing? Good, good. How is the audit world since I left? <laughs> uh, pretty much the same, I, I would say. Uh, yeah, we because we we work together at Amex, um, so now um, I'm two companies removed from that, but um, very much similar work from what we were doing. How about we begin with you telling us a little bit about yourself, aka your origin story on how you got into data in the first place? Yeah, definitely a little unconventional. Um, I actually graduated with an accounting degree. Um, and I, as soon as I graduated, I knew that's not what I wanted to do with my career. Um, so I ended up working in sales for a fintech company for about three years. and. Similar story. I didn't think that's what I want to do with my career as well. Um, but I worked with some pretty cool people who worked in data. Um, and that was around like 2017. Um, and I feel like data science was really like blowing up and becoming a cool thing. And all I saw was just like making magic with math and predictions. And I just thought it was so fascinating. Um, and I've always kind of been like a stats guy, especially, you know, with, uh, with sports and whatnot. Um, you know, I'm always like looking at the numbers and things like that. Um, so I just always had an inclination of kind of knowing that's what I want to do. So I was fortunate enough to where I could quit, um, move back home with the rents for a little while, uh, taught myself how to code in Python, which took about six months. I enrolled in a data science boot camp. Um, so that was three months. Um, it was, uh, you know, like nine to five, five days a week. We predicted home prices that took place in Iowa. Uh, for one of our projects. Um, so it was like a multilinear regression, decision trees, things such as that. Um, and then I had like an NLP project. Um, then after I completed that, it was, you know, hitting the the recruiters and I ended up landing a job at Amex, which is where I met you um, and worked on the data analytics team there. Did you learn Python before you took the boot camp? Yes. So okay. yeah, it was like you you kind of needed some qualification before they accepted you into the boot camp. Oh, okay. Um, so like because I didn't have like a master's in a STEM degree, um, knowing that I knew how to code well was like a big prerequisite. Um, so I, I made sure that I did like all the material that they recommended. I took some of their courses, um, and then I had a test that I had to take. And once I was accepted, uh, or once I passed that, I was accepted to the boot camp. Okay. Cool. And then what resources did you use um, when you were teaching yourself Python? Yeah, Udemy is definitely king. Um, <laughs> I, I think every other day when they have a sale, I'm probably looking or, or buying a course. Um, so that was, yeah, that, that was huge in, in me learning how to, how to um, you know, use Python because there are, there's so many different courses on there that not only teach you the fundamentals, but they provide you with projects and quizzes. Um, and if you want to do data science or just programming in general, like it covers all those topics. Um, so I was like instrumental in me definitely getting to where I'm at. Udemy is a good one. Um, do they ever not have sales though? I feel like every time I'm on the website, there's a sale. <laughs> they do. There are occasions where there's no sales oh, and they'll have okay. their courses for like $200, but then you just wait like a day or two and oh. then all of a sudden they're back to like $20, $25. You just refresh the page. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> All right, folks, that's that's the tip. Just refresh the page. <laughs> yeah, or wait a day. Yeah, definitely okay. do not buy a $200 course on there. And I don't uh, know if you mentioned it, but where was the boot camp offered? Was that also Udemy? It, no, it was New York City Data Science Academy. Um, so they're located in New York. Got yeah, it. So it was in person. Okay. Neat. Yeah. And... How well do you would you say that that boot camp prepared you for the real world? Yeah, I, I thought it was excellent. Um, I, I think you know you, you can pretty much find anything and learn anything you want, but like making sure that you have a resource to ask questions to um, and actually like do specific projects, I think is easier said than done. Finding that motivation, I, I think, just you know, doing this to push me to do these projects was like instrumental, um, again, because 
I was trying to do them on my own. And if I ran into a wall, you know, again, I had like no one to reach out to, or I'd get frustrated and kind of give up. Um, so it, it definitely put me in a position to where when I started, um, you know, at American Express, I feel like I was able to hit the ground running um, without even any professional or, you know, prior professional experience in the industry. That's great to hear. <laughs> yeah. So where are you now? What is your title and how do you use uh, data in your role? Yeah, so now I'm at Nomura. Uh, they're a Japanese investment bank. Um, so I'm still in New York um, and my title is VP, um, but that's like my corporate title within like our team on the data analytics SME. Um, so with audit, I you know, it, it's not really like cutting edge things, like you're not making money. So a lot of like the technology investment, we're a little far behind in that respect. Um, so a lot of what I'm doing is optimizing and automating things that auditors typically have done very manually, which typically involves Excel, um, you know, copying and pasting. Um, and a lot of these tests that we do are, are done, you know, typically on like a yearly basis um, or, or, you know, maybe bi-yearly basis. Um, so when auditors had to come back to a certain project, they would have to essentially do the entire thing again. Whereas, um, you know, with the analytics that I create, they can come in, they just get the data that they need, and then we can run the Python code that I had created from years before, and then boom, it's done, as opposed to taking, you know, weeks to do something, we can do it in, you know, a day or less. Exactly. Um, I selfishly asked Steve to be on um, the episode to basically tell my story as well, because we have the same path with the accounting degrees and with auditing. Um, as, as he mentioned, there's not a lot um, that has happened in a you know, innovation wise um, there. So it's really like ground up. But what's cool about that is that you get to build it yourself and get to see that growth. So yes, very awesome. I'm like reminiscing through <laughs> your storytelling, Steve. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think the cool thing about audit too, is that we cover like all different business units within a company. So it's not like you're just working on like marketing or you're just working on, um, you know, operations. Like we look at all these different aspects of the company. We learn about it. Um, so you're getting your hands in all these different pots of data and you're really understanding what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so I, I think it's it's pretty cool with, you know, ideas that you can create if you know the data of the company better than most people within the company, you can kind of figure out better analytics to kind of track if things can go wrong than even maybe the teams that you're working with. Exactly. Which um, I think lends well with our next question in that, like, how do you define data? So a lot of data roles that are out there right now, they have specific data sets that they work with all the time. But as you just mentioned, with auditing, you get to basically use any data that's available within the company, right? Yeah. So I, I guess for me, data is just anything that I can essentially throw into a table and derive insight from. Um, so, you know, to your point, like now we can scan emails um, and, you know, using NLP, we can uh, figure out specific keywords um, or, e or even sentiment of what we're looking at, um, you know, for if it's working emails that are sent, you know, to customers or, or customer type data, like, you know, we can look into that um, as opposed to just having, you know, database data set, you know, it's come through some source system. Um, you know, we have the option to read PDFs and kind of pull it from all these different places and not just, you know, one centralized location. What projects are you currently working on, like, that are your favorite? Ooh, that's a tough question. I, I've been on one project that has just been bogging me down and it's been pretty, pretty tough. Um, the, the hard thing, um, so I, I guess kind of backstepping a little bit, um, especially like working in finance, um, the reason why audit is... A good job is because there's so many regulations like i think this is perfect timing with a lot of these like banks essentially collapsing um I, there was actually regulations in place that were pulled back which kind of helped lead to this happening um but you know we need audit because with those regulations in place what people in my role do is they make sure that the company is following those things that we're not liable and you know we can't be sued or or nothing you know really terrible happens 
it's very hard to transition your data to like newer, more cutting edge systems. So a lot of the stuff is legacy. And I feel like as compared to a tech company, like we may be maybe like a decade behind and the information that we're like the data we're looking for is very siloed, which makes it very difficult to kind of figure out, you know, what we're doing. So a lot of the progress that I'm doing, the analysis isn't really difficult. It's finding the data and getting the data is really the toughest part. Um, so I, I don't know if right now I really have a, a favorite thing. I, I think maybe down the road when, um, you know, we have people on our team who create APIs actually, and then they are able to extract the data that way, as opposed to going through like these GUIs that we've had in place for, you know, 10 or 20 years that are just very cumbersome to use and, and tough to get the data from. Um, I think that's like something that I'm looking forward to working on and eventually doing. Um, but right now I'm kind of, my job has kind of just been extracting data and then just doing some simple analysis, but getting the, the data has been, you know, the really challenging part because like I kind of said, um, it's not as simple as just finding a database connecting to it. Like it, it could come from all these different places, getting access is very difficult. Um, and then, you know, throwing it together too, if there's not like a, a key identifier between those systems, you have to get a little creative as well. And then how much of your time are you spending cleaning the data? Um, it definitely varies. Sometimes we'll get the data and I can just do whatever I need to do immediately. Um, other times, yeah, it could come in some like weird type of HTML format. Um, that's not exactly HTML, but it looks like it is. So then I have to kind of use regex or a way to like plow through it and take exactly what I need, put that data into a table um, and then run with it. Um, so it, it definitely varies. And then there's two, you know, sometimes I have to like get access to emails and I have to use Python to scan the emails, um, you know, take whatever information I need, like the subject, even if it's the body of the email, the sender, things like that. And then put that into a data set also. And you mentioned a couple of times that you've been working on some NLP projects. Are these email projects one of those examples? Um, yeah. So Basically, we have to, for, for one of the tests that we're looking to do, um, if it's like, say, positive or negative, we kind of want to know what the sentiment of those emails are to help us basically get, like, get a key reading on what's kind of going on with those individuals. And, you know, if there's a lot of negative emails, we'd want to investigate those. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been going through the body of the, those emails, getting the sentiment score. And if it's above, you know, a certain threshold, then we kind of highlight those and we'll bring those to the business and kind of further ask, you know, what's going on here. That's awesome. Um, are these your favorite types of projects or do you more enjoy the analyses and statistics? Ooh, that's tough. I, I think I like the uh, analyses and statistics uh, a little bit more. Um, Cause I, I think for NLP at this point, like it's kind of like I have like steps that I need to take. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a plan whereas the statistics and um, analyses is a little bit more problem solving and not always the same every time that I'm working on a, a different project. Um, so it makes me think a little bit harder and I, I definitely, I enjoy that, I, I think at this point. Yeah, All right. the NLP work we're doing is not like too intense. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not really, uh, you know, um, pushing along too hard for those. Okay, so this is a side question. Are you pro chat GPT? Oh yeah, I, I definitely am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually, um, we had, it was available within our company for like a month, which is shocking okay. in itself. Um, Cause now all the banks, they've, I think they've restricted it. Um, Cause like I kind of mentioned before, a lot of regulations and mm -hmm. chat you can, anyone could potentially go in there and upload sensitive information. So Absolutely. they just blanket yeah. restricted it. Um, but I actually wrote an article while it was still available to the audit team. And I was kind of showing ways that you can use it to help auditors, like business auditors, learn how to use data analytics. Because a big initiative for us, too, is kind of educating business auditors be to become more, um, you know, data educated um, and kind of knowing what we can do and the capabilities of how we can help them out. So I did some, like, I, I asked ChatGPT, which I was kind of impressed by, was... I was like, I'm an auditor. I work, work at a bank. Um, I'm auditing trade, a trade surveillance system. Like, what are the test steps that I can, I need to take? And I had actually just done a similar audit, and it pretty much listed out all the steps, all the steps that we took um, to uh, for that audit. So I thought that was like pretty insane that it even like has that type of information and can give you like 
a pretty good idea of what you need to do um, in that setting. So that was really awesome. And then also just like asking things like they maybe like an auditor had like, like I mentioned, like PDFs and they're like, oh, I don't know if people can read PDFs. Like you can ask ChatGPT like using Python, can you read PDFs? And it'd be like, yes, you can do X, Y, and Z. So it also like, instead of them feeling like, I don't know if embarrassed is the right word, but like hesitant to come to me, like they could ask this thing and ChatGPT and then they know immediately that if it works or not, they can suggest it to me afterwards as well. Oh, that's a perspective that I never thought of is asking it rather than going to a coworker or your manager because you feel a little embarrassed that you don't know something and yeah. it encourages you to still learn and move forward. Right. Huh. Interesting. I'm I'm also surprised that it just like listed out all of the test steps. Like you don't have to go to ISACA and download your your audit yeah. papers anymore. <laughs> It's pretty wild. Um, and I, I immediately thought too, because as you know, like audit, like documentation is king in audit. So we have like like work papers for those who like don't know much about audit. Like basically anytime that we come in and we do a test, we have to create a work paper, which documents the test steps that we took um, and what our findings were, um, whether or not there were no findings or if there was something that the business had to further investigate or follow up on, like we'll document those things. Um, and then revisit those later on if we have to do similar testing. But as you can imagine, if you're testing all aspects of the business, this repository of work papers is just massive. Um, and at a lot of audit shops, it's not exactly pristine in how it's organized. So it can be rather difficult to maybe find a work paper from years ago. Um, so like, I mean, it was like, it would be really cool if someone was able to take like our whole repository of information and be able to put chat GPT over it and being like, Hey, from 2013, can you find me the work paper from XYZ audit? And then if it could locate that for you, um, I feel like it's just such a time saver because yeah. it's pretty difficult right now to, to find information um, within our department. Yeah. Cause I remember looking for things like, Oh, I did an audit five years ago that had similar test cases. Let's go search for that in hours right. wasted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Like similar, like what similar types of testing that maybe wasn't within this audit that's been done. And it's like, yeah, there's no good way to really search for that. Um, unless you're very good at keeping keywords, um, which mm -hmm. I think most people are not. <laughs> Well, especially in the corporate world where everyone yeah. has their own acronyms and every right. department has different um, uh, different definitions for each of their acronyms and just craziness. Yeah. Yeah. It's very hard for people to follow uh, guidelines, especially when it's, you know, 30, 40 hands in one pod. It's not all going to be consistent. What is your favorite department to audit and why? Ooh. That is that is definitely a tough question. What is your least favorite department <laughs> to audit and why? Uh, and why do I know? <laughs> is it AML? Is that what you're thinking? No. Or no? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, you said that though. <laughs> yeah. A AML is is very tricky, at least at some shops that I've worked at, because like IP addresses for restricted countries um, are kind of like always changing. And um, at least in my experience, like a lot of the data that we had was just like either stale um, or if it was being updated, it's still, there was like a lot of false positives that we were you know, getting. And there's just so much data because every day there's so many alerts that are generated. So you're also dealing with, you know, a massive quantities. Um, so I, I've just, in my experience, those, those audits have just taken me so much time. Um, and it's just been like back and forth, back and forth with the business, trying to figure out what's actually an observation and what's not. And it's just like, it's just so much investigating. Exactly. And for those that are curious, AML is anti-money laundering. And with that, there's just so many, like even false positives that you can run into where it's like, yeah, these people, they were, it just appears that they were sneaky with some money that it's just very strange at times. <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit about what your day to day looks like. Yeah. So it, it definitely depends, um, you know, on 
the project that I'm working on, but for the most part, um, like 60, 70% of my day could just be coding, whether or not it's SQL, Python. Um, we use other applications like Power BI, um, also NIME as well. I don't know um, if, are you familiar with that, Monica? NIME? No. So NIME is basically, it's like a more visual way without coding too of handling data. So it's like drag and drop icons. So you, like drag, you drag an icon and it will read the Excel file for you. Drag another icon and it'll uh, like filter the data for you. And then another, another icon will like group the data for you. So that's also something that we've been using as well. And there's like process mining is a feature of it too, which you can do in Python. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's just like another, um, I guess when you're looking at it from an audit perspective, like you have to kind of know how to code um, to look through someone's code. And if someone comes in and is checking my work, you know, they need to go through it. And if they don't really know how to code, they're probably gonna be like, what the heck is this? I, I don't, we don't even know where to start here, but at least with like nine, like it, it's kind of like a very visual step-by-step. -step, and I think it's much easier to kind of like read what's being done as opposed to just like a Jupyter notebook. Um, but yeah, yeah. So, so we use like a variety of tools. Um, but as I mentioned, like, like 67% of my day is, um, you know, coding through some type of use case. Um, and once I have some type of analysis, which usually the goal is, you know, we have controls in place, these co controls are meant to mitigate risk. And, um, you know, if a control fails, that means we may have a big issue on hands, like something maybe broken and all of a sudden like we're recording incorrect figures so we could be losing money um, or uh, maybe we're acquiring too much money which is also can be a bad thing um, so the output of whatever test i have is usually like okay where are these controls breaking and these are the ex specific examples and then i you know kind of in a storyteller way whether it's using power bi um, or even um, yeah, I guess Power BI is like the main way I'll, I'll do it, um, where I'll kind of show like a, a narrative of where I started, like what the systems were, um, how I got to this point and what the results were. And then we'll share that with the business and then they'll investigate those findings um, and figure out whether or not like there's a true break in the control. And if there is, then we kind of uh, label it as an issue and they have to address it by the next time we, we approach them with an audit. Um, but it's also like the role is a ton of collaboration because with that is this an actual break or not it's a ton of back and forth because maybe there's some filter that they didn't have in their documentation that is in place but they just never added it so i need to add that to my code or they have to explain some type of um you know business background to me which explains why you know these things are happening so it, it's a ton of collaboration on top of that coding aspect um so it's kind of nice where you have you kind of build relationships with relationships with people within the business and you get to show off your kind of data storytelling chops um, on top of you know the data um, on top of the coding that you've done as well and on top of that you're learning about the business itself right. so your yeah. domain knowledge increases right. which is another one of those big skills for data analysts and data scientists right yes yeah correct yeah amazing so that's your day job at work. How about not at work? Um, I heard that you are some kind of a movie buff. <laughs> I, I dabble. Um, I th yeah, for like, I would say in high school, um, I took a films class and I think that like, you know, within that class, we would watch a movie, dissect what's going on, like how people, how characters are placed in certain light to like be more powerful or like why shots are done. And that like really kicked off my um, interest within it. So I would say from high school until, I don't know, like four years ago, I would just like probably like once a week, at least I'd be watching at least that. Uh, I'd be watching one movie at least a week. Um, and especially when Oscar season rolled around, like I would more than likely have seen most of the movies that have been nominated, but I have definitely fallen off a little bit. Um, but the interest is definitely still there. Wow, that's a lot of movies. <laughs> yeah, I have um, an IMDb account where I like have my watch list of movies I want to see, and then I have all my ratings of um, the movies that I have seen. So I, I think I've watched, I don't know, I think it's like over 400 at this point, easily. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so yes, you definitely are a movie buff. <laughs> <laughs> so what movies have you seen that have helped you be a better data professional? Is that a thing? Are there are there data nerd movies out there? One I can think of, it like old school one that everyone talks about is Moneyball. Ah, uh, yes. So so it's it's funny because I mentioned in the beginning that I love sports and I love statistics, and that's the mm -hmm. one movie I have not seen is Moneyball. And I meant to watch it before this podcast too, so I could talk about it. But I know I know the background of it um, <laughs> because there's also the book The Signal and the Noise kind of covers this topic as well, um, mm -hmm. where it's basically the Oakland A's um, are not like a big market team, and the MLB is one of the few sports where there's no cap limit to like where you can sign players. So a lot of the big market teams like the Yankees. Um, or like the Dodgers, you know, they can spend a lot of money in order to acquire the best players. So like with the Oakland A's, because they're a smaller market team, they had to be a little bit more scrappy with how they were acquiring players because they could easily be outbid by the other teams. So they actually were the first to start using data analytics um, to, you know, look at the stats of different players and, and scouting and kind of figured out how to assemble a team based on these algorithms that they have created. And I, I think they went on to win the World Series, but they definitely like exploded um, and like rose to prominence very quickly. And it became this huge deal. Um, and I, yeah, it, it's fascinating because now like all these teams are using data analytics. Um, it's like football is probably my favorite sport. And I, there's a few websites that I follow um, where they're like, they've created their own algorithms of how they rank players each week. Mm -hmm. And with fantasy football, like it's all numbers. So it's like, it's just, yeah, it's kind of exploded into this whole thing where it's like people are betting and trying to predict who's going to be drafted and like become like scouts through using data analytics. It's, yeah, it's really cool. It's, it's, it's a fun community. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. How long ago was it now? I'm going to age myself. I don't know, like 10 years ago. Well, a very long time ago, March Madness was happening and uh, we did the whole bracket and whatever at work. And Tristan was like, oh, I'm going to do it in Python. And we were like called the Pythons or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think we did very well. But yes, there's so many yeah. applications to sports. Yeah. that's And the crazy thing, too, with sports is why it's so interesting is that there's so many variables that you just can't you can't collect in your data. Yeah. Like, like for instance, March Madness, like there's these Cinderella teams that the data will never say that this 16th seed will make it to the Elite Eight. Like it's just like some of these things are impossible <laughs> to predict. And within sports, too, like I feel like mental is such a big aspect of it. And yeah. you can't really like track, you know, there's no statistics that show like how a person is mentally on certain days or like how the relationships are going. And I think that's like where it's really like you can't replace the personal like scouts on those levels that are actually meeting the people because you'll like you can't really acquire data on those types of things. That's a really good point. I was thinking weather data, like if it was <laughs> raining outside, I guess you can predict a little bit in advance. I mean, depending on if you uh, trust weathermen, but yeah, the mental state definitely um, yeah. that's that that one's big interesting yeah. yeah and then i guess too when I, i'm like reflecting on like like obviously there's so many like ai movies out there and i feel like there's always two paths it's either like like world destruction or just like loneliness <laughs> like there, there's like the two it's like terminator where it's like machines take over and like the world ends and we're all screwed or it's like oh this person like lost their child or wife and they like recreated them using like an AI robot and now it's like filling that hole in their heart but now they're also like this isn't my wife or child I need to let go like it's that's true like, like her like, yeah yeah her AI um mm -hmm. yeah I think there's like a few like that um which is why I think like movies like like Blade Runner are so like cool because it's like the gray area of like what AI is I like the ones that mix in like the sci-fi yeah like the blatant sci-fi into it you know yes yeah, yeah. And then there's also, I, I mean, I mean, unforgettable. I think this is probably the top choice, Smart House. I don't know if you've seen this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I, yeah, I think another really good one too is Minority Report. I always heard the hype and it actually took me a very long time to watch that movie. And it's like, it's, it's really awesome. And it's like, if you're into like, 
predicting and AI, like I feel like it's definitely worth watching. Um, one of Tom Cruise's best movies for sure. Um, yeah, I really like that one too. I stumbled upon what was called the Nerd Oscars. Okay. <laughs> Have you seen? <laughs> right? No, I, I've never I heard went, of that. I, I went in and found some good stuff. Okay, so <laughs> this Nerd Oscars came about in 2020 where um, the Oscars were approaching and a group of FICO employees <laughs> were waiting <laughs> for a Zoom meeting and they were talking about Oscar nominees and they just like, started this nerd Oscars and they have this list of all of these amazing movies. I'll link the article in the show notes as well. And this phenomenon movie was um, deemed best depiction of the importance targeted queries to glean useful right. insights. That's a mouthful, but I watched the clip. Basically, it's this guy and he's sitting, I think he's being interrogated or something. I didn't watch the movie. I just watched this clip. And this guy was asking him questions and basically like timing him, like how long it took him to answer them. Because mm -hmm. I think he was just like some kind of genius, right? And so he answered things really quickly. Right. And so he was like, okay, so somebody was born in 1962. How old is he? And then he was like, wait, man or woman? And he was like, okay, a man was born and it continues on. And I think like that it was titled like be specific, Bob. So he, he he keeps having to get more and more specific. Like it was a man. He's still alive. He right. was born um, in, uh, oh, what time was he born? He was born at 1030 p.m. Where? He was born in New York because if he was born in New York, that's a lot different than if it was born in California, right? right? So it was just like, be specific, Bob. And it just, I mean, goes, it reminds me of how specific you have to be when gathering and uh, analyzing data because depending on where you are and what you, lens you're looking at, you have to be specific in answering the question. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a great point because uh, I have a friend who's from Korea and they have like different birthdays. Like he has <gasps> his American birthday and he has his Korean birthday. Wait, so, what? Yeah, so I, I think like they're I think the New Year is different from like when our New Year is. Oh. Um. So like, say like when he like I think he turned like thirty in Korea, but in America he wouldn't turn thirty for like another four months or I, I don't know what the actual gap is, but. Yeah, that's that's a data point that you would definitely need where it's like, okay, am I looking at this culture's birthday or, you know, my culture's birthday? Interesting. All right. So talking about learning things and how to analyze things, other than taking courses in boot camps, are there any other resources that you use when you're learning new things? Um, yeah, there's like a good book. Um, like I think when I first started to like automate the simple things, which is a book dedicated to Python, um, that, that was definitely helpful. I, I think it's also nice just to kind of, especially if you're working, if you're in this industry, you're looking at a computer all day. So it's nice to step away from the screen and look at something that's not glowing in your face. Um, and obviously there's workarounds with like screen dimming and those blue light glasses, but, uh, I don't know. It's just, I feel like a, a book is just nice to kind of sit on a couch with and continue your learnings, um, which has been helpful for me just to change it up. Um, cause especially, you know, like with anything you'll have days where like, you know, you don't have much motivation, you know, I, I, whether it's, you're not feeling well or, or whatnot. And I just felt like it's nice to kind of have different ways of doing things, uh, in order to still stay on top of what you want to do. Um, or else, you know, at least for me, I get, I get bored sometimes if it's just like the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Well, do you have any other last words of encouragement or recommendation for the listeners? Um, definitely check out the podcast if this is the first one. Um, I think there should be at least uh, maybe eight or nine more episodes. Um, I think there's other fantastic podcasts out there too. Um, I typically am using Spotify, but you know, there's so many other ways that you can listen to them and, um, you know, I, I guess shout out to like Data Skeptic and, you know, Super Data Science pod, Podcast. I think those are two pretty popular ones, but I've like learned so much, um, you know, just by listening to those and it's helped me stay, you know, relevant in, in what I'm doing. Um, and then also if you're considering 
a career in data analytics or data science, I, I think audit is a possibility that no one ever thinks about. Um, there's a lot of potential there. It's because it's so niche, um, I, I, it's actually kind of difficult for us to find people. So you're definitely wanted, um, which is a good thing for you because, um, you know, that, help, that helps out with a salary. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> yeah, it, it really is fascinating. Um, like I mentioned too, like, you know, we're, we look at all different aspects of a business. So it's not just one thing and you're kind of building everything from scratch at this point. We're kind of like the last of, those types of business units that, you know, still has a lot of work to do, um, you know, in creating our foundation for um, whether it's data analytics or, or, you know, machine learning, things like that. Um, and yeah, if, if you're starting out, um, just stick with it. Um, I, I think you'll know if you really like it after, I think it only took me about a month and I was like, this is, this is it, this is what I want to do. So if you just stick with it, um, yeah, you'll get there. Nice. And where can the listeners find you and or follow you? Oh, man, I'm like pretty much off the grid. Um, <laughs> I am on LinkedIn. Um, I'm not Steve Schaefer, though. I'm Steven Schaefer with a PH. Um, so, yeah, I definitely feel free to connect with me if you want to chat more, or, um, you know, kind of learn more about what I'm doing. If, especially if audit is an interest to you, um, you know, happy to speak through it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for coming on the podcast and sharing the story of amazing auditors. I appreciate it so very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me, Monica. I appreciate it. It was good seeing you. Yes. And as always, folks, happy learning.